How are y'all doing today? Good? Nisha's talk was great, wasn't it? Another round of applause for that. Yeah, seriously. I really, really thoroughly enjoyed that. So I'm so glad to be with you today. I hope that you can learn a lot. I hope that I can make some impact in your life. Um, I'm very excited to talk with you today. Today we're gonna to be talking about igniting your primal metabolism. Now before I get started, primal does not mean I'm gonna have you like gnawing on bones after the talk, okay? That's not what it is. It's, but it's understanding that you are designed with this innate ability to be a savage version of yourself. And again, when I say savage, I don't mean a leotard and leather and all that. I mean about some, your best version your best version, your most optimal version. And honestly, it's a super simple thing to understand. It's a super easy thing to tap into when you understand the basics and you get away from the noise. So before we dive into it though, I wanna talk a little bit about me. So I'm a family man, I have a little two year old, I have a wife who's been married for seven years. I'm an entrepreneur, I own uh, Keto Road LLC, which is a nutrition coaching company. And I also own Performance Gain Supplements, which y'all have come to the booth and enjoyed their products, which I really thank you for that. I'm also an FNTP, which is a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. And basically what that means is that I have been taught how to look at food as therapy and how to teach your body how to assimilate food as therapy instead of medicine. Um, now, now, before we dive into the whole story, I wanna talk a bit about my transition in life. So these photos, uh, I'm 27 in that photo, I'm 14 in that photo. So a lot of people, because I run ultra run, uh, ultra marathons, right? I, I run 50 milers, I run 50, 60 miles a week. I do all this crazy stuff that nobody wants to talk to me because they're like, you're insane, whatever. I want you to understand that that wasn't always me. It, it was not. I, I used to be a 260 pound, 14 year old kid that shoved chips in his mouth on the side of his bed every night and cried himself to sleep a lot because he hated who he was and he hated his life. I was not always this crazy runner that did all these crazy things. That took time. That's 10, 13 years of constantly working on myself, diving deeper. And one of the biggest things that I really want you to walk away with is that you can do this too. And I'm not asking you to run 50 miles, I'm asking you to be the best version of yourself. And when you say, oh, well, I'm not where you're at, well, neither was I once. I once were where I was at now, or where I am now. I, I wasn't. I used to be young, insecure, scared, very scared, overweight, obese, and I had high cholesterol, and it wasn't the, it wasn't the ribeye, lean mass hyper responder stuff that Dave Hill was talking about. This was hot and spicy McChicken's high cholesterol, okay? This was bad right? I used to be there and it's all up here. That physical transformation, I mean, do I like it? Of course I like it. It's cool. My wife likes it too, but it is not the main thing. This, what changed between my ears, the way I saw myself, the way that I wanted to care for myself, that was the biggest change. And there's an easy way to tap into him. I talk about it, I had this switch in my head and, and, and follow me with this imagery here for a moment. So imagine you have a room and imagine there's a door and imagine that the whole hallway's lit, it's always lit, that's your mind, right? There is a version of you on the other side of that door and it's really dark in that room and you've never met him because you're scared because you don't think you're worthy of meeting that version of you and if you would just be willing to kick that damn door down and turn on the switch, you'd be surprised who you'd walk into and I have learned confidently can say, I have learned to turn on that switch whenever I please. Whenever I want, I get to meet him. And I meet him all the time, and he's awesome. You have that too. You have that version of you. You really do. Like, I don't care if you're 80, 60, you have one leg, all the horrible things that have happened in our lives. That is not your future. You control that, and you can make the proper choices to make that happen. So what I wanna do is I wanna walk you through some simple things to help you start to tap into that before you leave this weekend. There's a version of you wanting to be let out. I'm not, it's not just that you're scared of meeting them or maybe they're dormant, they want out. There's something about you that is innate and beautiful and savage. And be, again, I'm gonna really like this to y'all's head. Being savage is not a bad thing. It's not some like carnal, monstrous thing. Like being savage is being cool, man. You can just be your best self at any time and have confidence in that. And you're capable of tapping into that. And I wanna teach you how. So there's three primal thoughts. There's three primal thoughts that I wanna go off today. That is human movement, whole foods, and connection to the earth, okay? It is literally that simple. We're gonna break it down a little bit so you understand it and comprehend it, but it's, you wanna tap into your most best self? Learn these three things. If you can apply these three things, you would be surprised how just 
awesome you can be. You have no idea what you're capable of. So let's preface some things first. Did you know 150 years ago, the average daily human step count was 15,000 steps a day? We struggle to walk 10, okay? That's like, that's like, that's a goal. That's like, that's like the scary number is 10K steps every day. We used to average 15,000. Humans are movers. Packaged goods are a luxury. You have to understand, Twinkies are 50 cents, but they are a luxury food. I know it doesn't feel like that because we have three-star Michelin restaurants, but Twinkies are a luxury food. That's something we get to enjoy because of modern science and technology. 150 years ago, humans could not eat out of packages. Yeah, we had tin cans and things like that, but nothing like we eat today. Everything we ate was grown or made noise, except for humans. Well, sometimes. It depended on you know where you lived, unfortunately. But anything that moved or was grown, it's a, it's a truth. I mean, I mean, I'll tell you how it is. Sunlight is a part of you. I really want to emphasize this before we get to the nutrition because it ties in. The sun and you and plants have a connection. You breathe out oxygen, or sorry, you breathe out carbon dioxide, they breathe in it, they breathe out oxygen, you breathe in oxygen. Y'all both photosynthesize to the sun. They make food, you make vitamin D. That in, you know, is important for almost every function in your body. It, it's such an essential hormone. Sunlight is a part of you. Without it, we don't function right. We need it. Okay, you know how many people live a life in a house with a roof, with no door, no window? Their skin, you know, I understand some people have skin sensitivities, but you never get out in the sun, you never expose yourself to it, you're depressed, sad, you don't move, you're unhealthy, and you wonder why. Sunlight can be the first step. Literally, exposing yourself to the sun can be the first step to a health journey. It really can, it can be that simple. The earth can heal. Okay, so we share, I'm, I'm not going to get too hippie on you, but we can share frequencies with the ground. We do share frequencies with the ground. And when we connect with those things, they heal us. Our bodies are meant to touch the ground. And of course you say, well, John, people have worn sandals and slippers for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, but they were made of leather. They didn't hinder frequency. Rubber does. Look at your feet. Y'all all wearing rubber right now. I just want to be aware. Now we're in a two-story, we're, we're on the second floor of a building, so it's okay. But I'm just saying. Bare feet to the ground makes a difference. So I want you to understand these things as we continue. Now, where did we go wrong? Okay, so the first thing was the Industrial Revolution. And I want you to understand why it happened and what we can do to fix it, right? Because oftentimes, if you don't know the problem, you can't really address it. So much about this revolution was good. However, the monopoly of food and pharmaceutical giants has created a broad and Western narrative. So basically what that means is... Food industries and pharmaceutical companies, man, they're friends. At the top top, they're friends. And they love to put you in this vicious cycle of eat and get sick and take pills. Eat, get sick, take pills over and over and over again. Now, while the Industrial Revolution was good in so many ways, right? You get to take phones. I get to record this talk and share on YouTube. All that stuff's great. So the good things can come from it. But humans can also do evil things when they want to. And they have with these things. Right, commercialization of food, foreign and local policies. This is not a political talk, but I want you to understand that foreign policy plays a role in how we ship and receive goods. And part of us making more money and becoming a global power put our food at a detriment because we started sending our seasonal food overseas and bringing their seasonal food over here, and our bodies do not connect with that food because it's not in season, right? And so our foreign policies, while good economically, have sometimes destroyed our health, but it's okay because the pharmaceutical company picks up that slack and makes money off of us too. So it's not a big deal, right? It's, it's all, it's good, it's good. Okay, we live in a technological society. Great, great, phones are great. Your phone is killing you. I want you to be, I want to be very, and I'm talking about 5G right now, and people have strong opinions about 5G. I'm talking about the fact that you look at it all day. The fact that it, it, it dictates whether you have value in yourself or not. The fact that most people can yell at somebody and call them horrible names on Facebook, but they don't know how to tell somebody hi when they see their eyes, okay? Your phone is killing you, and you need to understand that. That doesn't mean it's bad. That doesn't mean you can't use it. You have to learn how to have a healthy relationship with it, and that first starts with recognizing that most of us have bad ones. And then heart attack scare. So this is really when we talk about the food industry. So in the 1950s, right, uh, Eisenhower had a heart attack. And this is just 30 years after um, canola oil and seed oils went from machine lubricant to food products. Okay, so oh, and they still use it on machines. So understand what you fry your chicken in, they're using on the machines that make the oil, right? It, it's, it's all used. So understand that Ansel Keys, do you know who Ansel Keys is? Oh, yeah, yeah, good, nice. So Ansel Keys did the seven-country study. It was horrible, and they even debunked it 
really early on, but no one, you know, the American Heart Association completely ignored them. Um, and so that's where we get the guidelines that have been so hard to fight when people like Dr. Paz and Ben Azadi, myself, fight every day is because of those movements and the powerhouses that be that played those cards. So the first thing I wanna talk about is that humans are built to move. I know, I know this is a keto nutrition conference. This is gonna get a little uncomfortable, but I promise, stay with me. You are meant to move. The average step count today is 3,000 steps. I know 3,000 3, the number, it's like 1,000. That's not that much. That's like going to your pantry for the Oreos back and forth about 100 times, and you're done. You're done for the day, right? The average Amish man or woman walks anywhere from 14 to 18,000 steps today. Has anybody met an unhealthy Amish person ever? No. Oh, you have? Oh, my. Oh, we got one in the room. Oh, man. That's unfortunate. Yeah. But yeah, most of the time, though, they're, they're agile. They're moved. Their joints don't hurt. They're very, they're, they're very healthy in that area. We lack movement. Humans are meant to move. You don't have to move as far as me, but you need to move. And let me also address something. Sometimes some people that might hear this later can't walk. Can't walk yet. Right? I've had many clients over 300 pounds. They can't walk. You don't have to walk to move. Move is not, movement is not defined by walking. Doing this, getting some armbands. I've had clients step on armbands and just do curls to start. Just moving your body. It is important for so many things. It's important for flushing your lymphatic system, draining inflammation, draining fluid. It's important for your circulatory system, your nervous system. Movement is a part of your health. And oftentimes people say you don't have to move to lose weight on keto, but I'm telling you that you have to move to keep it off. That is a reality. If you do not move, you will not stay healthy. Remember, the diet is a good part. It's a good foundation, but it is not the end-all be-all. And I'm telling you, movement is one of the biggest parts of longevity, okay? So I wanna talk about two studies here just to prove my point here because I think it's important to go back to the science. Your physical health. A meta-analysis took 22 randomized control trials and found that a brisk walk for three hours a day, split it up, do an hour, three times a day, do three, whatever. Three hours a day, don't even count the steps, three hours a day, right? Showed less body mass index, lower waist circumference, and fat mass index went down. Three brisk walks a day, and this study didn't look at diet, right? So imagine you put in the diet that you know, Nisha just went over, or I'm about to talk about, on top of that. Now you're creating a powerful, healthy lifestyle change. Movement is powerful. This and other analysis replacing 60 minutes of screen time Phones, mm. 60 minutes of screen time to moderate vigorous activity really healed them and it increased from depression, mental well-being. So they looked at uh, depression, anxiety, um, overall mental well-being. 60 minutes off the phone, out the door, changed so many people's lives just by moving. All they did was move. There was no medication. There was no trying to figure out what to eat at the store, just the movement. And I just don't think it's something that we really emphasize in this space enough. And I know I'm a runner, so I'm kind of biased in terms of moving, but it doesn't matter. Movement is important. It can be the game changer. There are people in here that have been keto for years and can't figure out what the next step is, and they're too scared to get off their couch. They're too scared to get off their couch. And they would be surprised what would happen if they empowered themselves to move a little bit more. So a couple tips, because I'm not gonna leave you with some you know, struggling challenge. I wanna give you some tips on this, okay? So keep it short and simple. It doesn't have to be crazy. You don't have to get crazy. Go for a walk. Walk your dog. Stop letting them out in the backyard and shutting the door and sitting down. Put them on a leash and take them for the walk, right? Bite off what you can chew. This is super important. I always say, bite off what you can chew when your jaw is sore, okay? So what that means is when you start a healthy lifestyle, like you leave this, you leave this talk and you'll be like, man, I'm gonna do 15,000 steps a day, hell yeah, right? And then like you do day one, 15,000, day two, 15,000, day three, 15,000, day four, your cat dies, day five, you pop a tire, day six, you're doing 8,000, day nine, you know, and it goes on and on. Next thing you know, life happens and you can't hit your goal. Two things that happens. One, it demoralizes you, right? And then it creates habits of inconsistency because now you're not hitting your goals. It would be much better to go, you know what? What could I do if life sucked today? If everything went wrong, what could I commit to? Okay, 7,000 steps, six, five, whatever you come up with. Start with that, do that, and then when life's good, that's gonna feel easy. When life's hard, it's gonna be doable. Once you get used to that, then you increase, right? Again, motivation is a killer. I, I, 
people really like motivation. Motivation is a killer. I really am starting to pull back from it as a positive word because it kills people. Because they get super excited, they bite into things, and then they fall back. And over time, their discipline is horrible because their motivation caused them to bite off more than they could chew. Focus on building habits. There's a great book called Atomic Habits. Read it. That's all I'm going to say on that. Buy Atomic Habits. Read it. I'm not affiliated. I promise. Make sure rest is a focus. This is important. If you're sore, rest. You don't have to be a superhero. You don't have to work out every day of the week. You need time off. You are not superhuman. You are human. I know people say, oh, you're superhuman, like motivationally, but like, no, you're human. You have flesh, bones, you know, a heart. Give it time off. Fifth one, though, challenge yourself. This is a big one for me. I was talking about this earlier. We were talking about running 10 miles and how that was really hard. For, for, for the person. And I, you know, for me, running 10 miles used to make me cry. I remember running my first eight mile run in the last two miles, I cried the whole time. Now I can go, I, I ran six miles this morning, no problem, right? And that's not to glow, it's to say, what was once hard is now easy. And if you're willing to push yourself beyond what you think you're capable of, you would be surprised what you can achieve. You would be so surprised. When you think 500 steps is difficult, Try 550. Once you do 550, do 600. Once you do 600, do 650. Always push your limits, but meet yourself where you're at. And that can be a hard balance sometimes. And it takes time to figure out exactly what that's going to look like. That's okay. You have 27,000 days. I don't know if you're going to watch that. Need to catch that? No? All right. So celebrate the small wins. I didn't know that. 27,000 days doesn't feel that like that much. Like I read it and I was like, that's see, I want 50, 50,000. But then I realized then we'd be all be 200. So I don't know that worked out. It just seems small, you know? All right, celebrate the small wins, okay? So, this is so important because most of us that come here, I know me, I used to, when I tell you I used to loathe myself, I used to hate myself. I know I stand here all like, yeah, I can do all this stuff, but like this is confidence I built through word, action, and identity over time, right? I used to loathe myself. I mean, I was a staunch bulimic. I was throwing up three times a day, every day for years. We didn't get into that. In t we didn't get into that today. But I have an incredibly horrible history with bulimia, and um, I did it out of self hate because I need other people's approval, and I based that off the way I looked. And I went from 260 pounds to 170. I was skin and bones. I was making myself puke all the time, um, and I just loathed myself. And it took time for me to love who I am. And one of the big things I started doing when I went on that journey was I celebrated the small wins. When I went a day without binging, that was a win. When I went a day without throwing up, that was a win. When I put on my shoes and went outside for the first time in two weeks, that was a win. Now, does that mean that's where you should stop? No, add the other tips. Challenge yourself, take three steps, take four, but celebrate when you achieve that. Don't go, yeah, I'm not at 10,000 yet. Who cares? You're at 50, you've never been at 50 before, that's awesome. Don't play the comparison game. It's you versus you versus you versus you, and leave it at that. Okay, so let's hop into the diet. So before I dive into the nutrition part of this, if you wanna leave it right here, this is like three simple things. If you just wanna like take this photo and run, I'd be really, I feel like you're so empowered, it's great. Three things. You eat animal fats, you're supposed to eat animal proteins, and you're supposed to eat seasonal carbs, or you can. If you literally leave it at that, you're good. Literally, if you eat what's in season in your area, so you only buy carbs from the farmer's market and you buy meat. If you do that, you will be solid for the rest of your life nutritionally. That's it, That's, it literally can be that simple. Meat market, farmer's market, say it with me. Meat market, farmer's market. It can literally be that simple. Like where do you shop? Meat market, farmer's market. And you can leave it at that. You really could when it comes to food. Oftentimes we don't because obviously autoimmune, you know, things get spicy. We're gonna dive into a little bit here. But if you really wanna start really simple today and you don't know exactly where to start and you feel overwhelmed, right there. Those three things, super simple, okay? Now, let's talk about fats here. So first thing to understand about fats is why are they so essential? So we're gonna do a quick 101 on all the macronutrients because I like to explain these things. So fats can create hormones, they create cell membranes, okay? They um, heal the myelin sheath, They're, the myelin sheath is made up of them, that's the, the thing that covers your nerves, right? Cell membrane, the thing that makes up what covers your nucleus, your mitochondria, all the beautiful stuff. All of that's made up from fatty acids. I want you to look at your hand, everybody look at your hand. That is made up of fat. 
what fats did you eat like a week ago? Because that's literally what that's made out of. I want you to think, you literally are what you eat. Now, some people would argue and say you are what you absorb, but that's, that's nuancy. I'm not gonna dive into that today. Uh, but you, literally, if you ate a Twinkie, that's not just gonna get you know out. That you're gonna be made of that Twinkie. You will be made of it. You'll find I have a problem with Twinkies. Like there's a serious issue. I bring them up as bad examples all the time. But like you're literally made of it. Okay. You need to understand that. Animal fats always. So a lot of people talk about animal fats and saturated fat because the first thing we say when we when we try to encourage animal fats is what saturated fats not bad. That's the first thing we say. It's like the knee-jerk reaction that we feel like we have to convince you of. Saturated fat sounds bad. Eat animal meat. But did you know that beef is only 60% saturated fat, and in some cases 40% saturated fat? It is made up of so many omega-3s, and if it's grass-fed, even more so, and monounsaturated fats. It's almost 50% monounsaturated fats and then some polyunsaturated fats. Depending if it's grain-fed or grass-fed, you'll get more omega-6 to omega-3s. Literally, it's not all saturated fat. That is, that is a, something, it's a lie you've been told. When people go, oh, eat ground beef. Oh, it's saturated fat. It's like half saturated fat. You don't know what you're talking about. Animal fats are always the goal here. Now, so I don't know if you have any blood labs. I like to put tips on this I got there. If your HDL is not very high, you can always add in some wild caught fish. That will help a lot, right? So if you're only eating ruminant animals and you see the HDL kind of low, and you don't want to add any added fats, you can always add in some fish, some good wild caught high omega-3 fish that tends to do the trick. Um, also, if you don't digest beef well, eat fish, really good, okay? Now, some plant, plant fats are okay, okay? Coconut oil, fine. Avocado oil, fine. Extra virgin olive oil, fine. One location. If it has more than one city, country on it, run. If it's not in a glass bottle, run. If it is not super dark, run. If the olive oil does not burn the back of your throat when you taste it, run. Okay, simple, simple. Coconut oil, if it's, if it's liquid at room temperature, run. It's not supposed to be like that, that's nasty, okay? It's supposed to be solid because it's mostly saturated fat and they are solid at room temperature, okay? Simple rules. Couple tips on fats. Everybody, the amount you need is different and I really wanted to get to this part. Not everybody needs to eat the same amount of fat, okay? Some people love high-fat keto or high-fat carnivore. Some people love high-protein keto. That's fine. As long as you follow general guidelines, you'll be okay. Make sure you're not over-consuming. Right? So if you're, if you're eating a carnivore diet and you're gaining weight, you're eating too much fat. It's really that simple. You're eating too much fat. Stop eating so much fat. Look for signs that you're under-consuming. Right? So if your fat's low, you're going to see lack of mental clarity. Right? You're going to have hunger. And generally, you're going to have a low sex drive. Right, because saturated fat is the precursor to cholesterol, which is the precursor to progesterone, which is the precursor to everything else in your body that allows you to have a libido and all the amazing things that we love. Fat is not going to destroy your heart. Do not fear it, okay? Simple stuff. Also, fat ratios can differ wildly. I just went over this, but anything between 50 and 80% of your daily intake is okay. So as I say, as long as it's the primary thing in your macro ratios, it's fine. Now, easy way to do that is just eat steak, obviously. If you do that, you'll be within that range. You'll be fine. But I like to preface that if you do track macros. Okay, proteins. Muscle is key, okay? So proteins are essential for growing muscle. That's what we know them for when you hear protein. If you don't eat protein, you deteriorate. If you eat protein, you build. We understand that. But there's so much. Amino acids make up your entire body. There's a reason they're essential, just like fatty acids are, okay? Animal protein is superior, again, there's studies on this that plant protein needs way more to stimulate protein synthesis. There's a lot of incomplete proteins in the plant world, right? Animal proteins are superior. And if you don't want to eat meat, you can always eat fish. Also, you can always do eggs. If you are a vegetarian and you just cannot fathom the idea of eating meat, just eat eggs. I promise you, unless there's a, I'm going to give you a quick farming 101. Unless there's a rooster present, it's just going to, they're going to lay them anyways and they're not gonna hatch. You're not eating a chicken, you're eating nothing. Just eat it. Seriously, you're not harming anybody in the making. I'm, I'm serious. A lot of people don't know that. They're like, oh my gosh, it's gonna turn into a chicken. I'm like, is there a male present? No, well, then it's not gonna happen. You're just letting it go to waste. It's gonna rot, and then the chicken's gonna eat her own egg. And that's gonna be way more weird for you than you eating it, I promise, once you wrap your mind around it. So just eat the egg, okay? Okay, so a couple tips on that. Shoot for one gram per pound of desired body weight, right? So, and the reason I went to this, I used to say one pound per gra one gram per pound of body weight, but some people that have hundreds of pounds to lose, that is literally impossible. So go to the, go with the desired body weight. 
make sure that you're being rational about that. As someone with body dysmorphia, we can be extremely irrational with the desired body weight. So. I'm sorry, ladies, if you are 5'10 and you want to be 120 pounds, good luck. Eat more protein. It's not going to happen. Okay, so understand height, gender, how that impacts overall weight goals. Okay, super important to understand. All right, now look for signs that you're under consuming, lack of muscle growth, all right, constant soreness, achy joints, simple stuff. If you're, if you're working out and you're super sore all the time, you're probably not getting enough protein. If there's constant soreness, you're probably not getting enough protein. If you're not hitting the one gram per pound of desired body weight, you're probably not getting enough protein. Try to get the most from Whole Foods, but I have a supplement company. I'm not scared of supplements, okay? I have, I'm cool with supplements. I like protein powders. They're yummy, okay? And they're convenient, and they taste good. It's okay. Just don't make them the bulk of your diet, all right? And try to get at least 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal because that's what's shown to pro stimulate protein synthesis. So if you want to keep building muscle, try to get 25 to 30 grams. You can have more than that. The absorption rate thing, that's nonsense. Don't go down that rabbit hole on YouTube. Just trust me on that. You don't think you will, but if you start researching what I just said, you will go down that rabbit hole. Don't do it, okay? All right, let's talk about carbs. Oh, man, this is, oh, man, oh. This is, the, uh, this is the skeleton in the room. All right, so once, carbs are not needed for life. And I'm not gonna stick on carbs too long because that's not what this talk is for, but understand that carbs are not essential. We know this, right? Meaning, again, uh, as Nisha put beautifully, if they pulled all the carbs out of the world, none of us would die, okay? If they pulled all the fat and protein out of the world, we would all crumble and perish, okay? However, not all get away with that, okay? And I'll go into a little bit about what I mean by that. Some women, due to cortisol responses, respond well to strategic carbs placed in their diets. I'm not afraid to say that. I've experienced it. I've coached on it. It's what I specialize in. I'm not afraid to talk about it, okay? Also, with ketogenic endurance athletes, obviously both male and female because the females already need them, so if they're endurance athletes. I just like to preference that because one time I was at a talk and I said endurance athletes and women, and someone got really pissed off at me because they were like, women can't be endurance athletes. And I was like, then you know that's not what I meant. She's like, that's what you said. So I just want to make sure I preface that. I mean, both women and men endurance athletes and then women, okay? If you eat them, make them whole foods, okay? It needs to grow in the ground if it's going to be something that you ingest, just to be on the safe side. Things like fruits, tubers, and gluten-free grains. This is something that's debated, the grain part, the gluten-free grains. I have experimented and learned that for some people, right rice is the only carb they digest, and I've seen it work really well for them, and they don't like fruits because they cause binges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we go with. So I'm okay with gluten-free grains personally if it's something you need in strategically, all right? Test and see what works for you. N equals one, right? N equals one. All right, so talk about why I'm okay with carbs, just briefly. Did you know, while not essential, carbs have been consumed for all of human history. That tree has five different fruits. Fruits don't grow like that, but I didn't want to put five trees with five different fruits. So they all got put on one tree, okay? Now, it's not a necessity, but in some cases, beneficial. Not a necessity, in some cases, beneficial, okay? It's safe to say that gatherers and tribes, which back then, mainly were women, and they would sink their hormones to consuming carbs in season. When they gathered, or they went hunting and gathered, they would eat, tend to eat more carbs. Gatherers would eat more carbs. Why? Because they were right there, and they were pretty looking, and they probably tasted good. So they would, it would make sense that if hunters really adapted well overall, as all, all of them were, to eating only meat and fasting and being strategic with that, it would make sense that if people tend to gather as well, even if they did hunt also, if they gathered too, their hormones would sync with that as well. That makes sense. Also with the full moon. We all know that cycles sync with the full moon, yeah? That's a thing, right? Well, so does food growing, and so does uh, pollination, and so does produce. It all syncs. It's all, it's all together. It's, it's pretty wild, honestly. Now, apples from the same tree. While humans do not need whole carbs to live, we share a special relationship with them. We share air. We share soil. We share frequencies. We share sunlight. I'm sorry but a banana is not necessarily a bad thing. Now, we can talk about GMOs, we can talk about the, the, the main brand that's in stores, but I'm telling you, I went to the Philippines and there was not, they have 10 different varieties and none of them are genetically modified at all. Those fruits in proper dosages for some people are not bad, they're not. And again, I, what I want you to leave with this is this thought. I don't want you to stop eating carbs or choose not to because you're scared of them. I want you to because you're empowered and choose not to. Right, because that first one leads to binges. That first one leads to inconsistent diet. You should be empowered, understand them from a healthy perspective, and then go, you know, I don't need those. I don't need those, okay? All right, so understanding 
why you may need them. All right, so when your body is stressed, right? So stress can be from your kids. I have a two-year-old, it happens. Two-year-old stress, family stress, job stress, cycle stress, sports stress, 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 right? Keto and fasting are also stressors. Quick biology lesson, why? Because when your blood sugar dips, in order to start producing ketones, which is why we love the ketogenic diet, a process called gluconeogenesis starts. Your body releases cortisol to stimulate that. Why? Because low blood sugar is a stressful position. Your body doesn't want super low blood sugar. Releases cortisol to stabilize blood sugar, and then you remain stable. That's a beautiful thing about your body. However, when it's coupled with a bunch of other stress, it starts to bleed over, okay? And when that happens, insulin is constantly releasing your body, just like blood sugar will be constantly elevated, and it will get worse and worse and worse. That same thing happened on standard American diet to you. That's why you went keto. So what is this process, what is this circle called here? It's called physiological insulin resistance. It's where due to the amount of stress in our body and us not dealing with it, we create this cycle of insulin resistance within our body, right? The best way to handle it scientifically is to use strategic carbs at the right time to blunt the cortisol response. That lowers blood sugar, allows your body to tap into fat burning, and you're good to go. It really is that simple. Now, that doesn't mean all of you need it, but it's something good to understand so that you can be empowered. All right, so signs that you need carbs. Let's talk about this. Uh, some of these are for everybody. Some of these are not. You'll know why when I read them. Uh, no more cycle. As much as people love to tell you carnivore harder fruits, then generally that's a good one to go for. Start slow. You will put on water and fast sometimes. Be easy. Right, so what'll happen oftentimes is someone will be gaining weight because they're stressed out, they're physiologically insulin resistant, they've been carnivore for three years and they can't stop gaining weight. I will tell them, hey, you need to add some carbohydrates. They'll add in carbohydrates, they'll gain five pounds overnight and they'll say, I've gotten fatter. And I'm like, that's impossible. It's impossible, right? But it's water weight because for every car, uh, glucose molecule, you retain three molecules of water. Okay, so if you eat 100 grams of carbs, you're gonna put on 30, 300 grams of water, roughly. Right, And so some people lose weight, but some people gain weight. That's not the end of the world, it's just water. It, do not listen to the scale on this. You need to listen to your body and how you feel. Also, another thing, just a quick tip for my people that have disordered eating and they're scared to do this. Don't go back to trauma-related foods. So there are certain foods that I won't eat, right? Like white cupcakes, for a lot of reasons, but that's definitely one of them. Um, I haven't had one of those in seven years, don't plan on it, okay? I don't eat those foods. I have trauma associated with those foods. I have clients that have trauma associated with bananas, so they cycle out on sweet potato and vice versa. I have clients that used to binge mashed potatoes. We don't eat mashed potatoes. They eat blairies, they eat, they eat mangoes, they eat pears when they need to cycle out. Understand that that's the, bit, that's the best way that you can avoid um, being, if you're afraid of binging. Like that's a great way to do it. So I talk about, people talk about like macro abstinence from food. So you have like your abstainers and your moderators. We're talking about macro uh, abstinence, but I want you to think about micro abstinence. It's not carbs themselves, it's what carbs trigger me. Learn those things, be aware of those things, and then work around them to achieve your health goals. Okay, so I wanna end with the primal habits. So we've talked about movement, we've talked about nutrition, a lot of information I know. I'll go through the last three quickly. So the first one is sunlight, okay? You need sunlight, at least an hour to two a day. You need it, you need it. If you work from home, take your lap outside. If you work at a desk or an office, go outside for lunch, go out before you start your shift, go out after your shift's over. Don't immediately get in your car, sit down, be exposed. If it's too hot where you're at, go buy a sunlight. They have those, like 15,000 luxes. It's temporary fix, but it works, right? At least on the weekdays. Do something, don't just not sit in sunlight. You need it, you need it, you need it. It boosts vitamin D, it decreases the risk of depression. We have science on this, very, very clear literature on it, okay? Second primal habit is grounding, all right? Grounding, you should ground for at least 20 minutes daily. If you're wondering where I got those numbers, I made them up, no, I'm kidding. Uh, they were in the studies. Uh, so grounding is important for a lot of things, but. I'm not joking, and I can, if you want, you can email me and I'll send you the studies on this stuff. It reduces inflammation, reduction in inflammation. Grounding reduces inflammation, why? Because it helps remove what's called free radicals from our body, okay? Just like antioxidants. So antioxidants, we eat and they remove free radicals, and then the frequency with the ground removes free radicals, right? So you can do both and remove a lot of free radicals. So grounding is awesome. It also has healing properties. People have healed, like joints, issues, muscle tears, headaches, Grounding is an extremely powerful thing. And I did this last year at the pool after my talk, but 
I don't have a tree here, so I can't do exactly what I wanted to do. But you don't have to have soil to ground. You just need to be touching something that's in the ground. So like if you live in New York and you just got trees coming out, you know, like, you ever, I've never been to New York, but I've seen the photos and it's like the weird little square and the trees come out of the square. Just, just lean on the tree, just lean on the tree. I know that seems silly and it seems too simple to be true, but it really is that simple. Just lean on the tree. Okay, meditating. Ooh. Okay, so meditation. Meditation so, so good. 30 minutes daily can increase mental health and reduce stress. Meditation is huge. What is meditation? Meditation is anything that takes you out of your own silly head. That's what meditation is, right? And the reason I say that is because you'll hear some people, like, you know, like yoga instructors, like meditation is like a quiet with the, you know, the, 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 the sounds and stuff. And for some people that is because it takes them out of their head. For me personally, it's reading my Bible and then sitting in silence for 30 minutes and trying to hear God. That's my, that's my meditation. And that's for me. Your meditation may be going outside and putting a blindfold on and feeling the heat hit your skin and you're trying to understand what's going on. I don't know. Just take 30 minutes to get out of your own head every single day and really just be in the moment with yourself. It can be an extremely, extremely powerful tool. So sunlight, grounding, and primal habit meditation, okay? Now, the strongest, most resilient, most effective version of you includes human movement, whole foods, and connecting to the earth. Those are the, th I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you just, if you choose today to start moving, you eat animal fats and proteins and seasonal carbs, you get in the sun, you ground and you meditate, you will find a version of yourself that you never thought possible. And I know it sounds too simple to be true, but oftentimes the simplest things can uncover the truth. Thank you. Do we have time for Q&A? Do we have time for Q&A, Erica? Absolutely. Okay. Um, okay, also real quick, I swear this is not a sales pitch, but I really want to put this in here for you guys. So I, so if you want like what I just talked about, but you want a 70 page PDF, it's really like it has workout programs, tracking habits, all this crazy stuff. You can get it. It's usually 37, it's like 40 bucks. I did for 12 for the Orlando Summit. So I like cut like 75% off of it. You're welcome to it. You don't have to buy it. You just heard like 20% of it anyways. Um, but yeah, so it's there for you guys. All right, so questions. Let's do Q and A if y'all have any. Yes, Mary. Are there specific times, you've talked a lot about women's cycles, and I know that that is part of your specialty. Is there specific times within that cycle that you recommend carbs in a different, in a different way than you would just willy-nilly on listening to your own body, but more like listening to your face? Yeah, absolutely, that's good. So, okay, so she asked if, uh, did y'all, everybody hear? Okay, I didn't want to repeat it. Yeah, three phases of your cycle, technically four, right? You have your menstrual phase, you have your follicular phase, you have your ovulation, your luteal phase. So for simplicity's sakes, we'll just talk about the luteal phase and the, uh, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So you have to understand hormones to understand when to use carbs, if you're gonna use them strategically. Now this is, get, this is assuming that you have a healthy cycle already. I always say if you, don't have, if you don't have a cycle, you need to do carbs strategically every day at the right time until your cycle comes back. Once it comes back and it's regular, then we'll talk about strategic implementation because we got to keep the cortisol blunted long enough for your sex hormones to come back up. And I don't want to put you on sex hormones because usually if you have a cycle, you're too young for that. You don't need it. Um, now let's just assume that you have a regular cycle, right? So the follicular phase, testosterone and estrogen are slowly peaking to peak to ovulation, right? Because it's getting ready to drop an egg so that you can fertilize the egg and then obviously reproduce life, okay? So progesterone is coming down and those two are coming up. Cortisol is really low. You feel your best right after you stop menstruating until you ovulate, you're gonna feel better and better and better and better and better. And then it peaks at ovulation. Ovulation, you a bad girl, you bad. You're gonna get it, right? You're gonna go to the gym, you're gonna crush it, but like you're just gonna crush it, right? And that's just how your cycle works. After ovulation, your your body does not care about how you feel at all at that point. It is It assumes that there is a fertilized life. It assumes that life is about to start. And so therefore it starts focusing on that. Sex hormones drop, cortisol goes up as your body starts to prepare for what it assumes is gonna be a really stressful situation. Now, what we talk about, carbs blunt what? Stress. Stress, good. So generally during the first, that's right, stress, yeah, cortisol. During your follicular phase, you don't need many carbs if you have a healthy metabolism and healthy cycle because your cortisol is not very high. That's the best time to fast, it's the best time to do strict keto, it's the best time to run with it, lift heavy weights, all that stuff. 
as you get into your luteal phase, you want to be more strategic with your carbohydrates. That's when, and it really depends on, on, on the person, but it could be daily. It could be only when they train post-workout. Um, but that's when you're going to want to add carbs is usually during that luteal phase. Something else to add too is that as estrogen decreases, your muscles ability to contract, the elasticity of your muscles goes down. Estrogen, that's why women that have too low of estrogen, they have super intense cramps when their period starts because progesterone gets too high, estrogen gets suppressed. And so their muscles are much tighter on, around their uterus than they should be. And you get really intense cramps, right? So having that regulated is super important, but don't go too hard at the gym, not just from an energy perspective, but there's a higher risk of injury going into your luteal phase and in your follicular phase. Yeah. Postmenopausal. That's a good question. So usually, it usually takes a little bit more lab work. So generally, with someone that's postmenopausal, and, and I would say sixty percent of my clients tend to be perimenopausal, menopausal. Um, typically, I'm going to want to look at cortisol, progesterone, pregnenolone, uh, all those hormones, because I'm going to want to understand what's going on, and then we go from there. Some need uh, bioidentical progesterone, some do not. Um, as far as the carbohydrates go, it really depends on exactly what's going on, right? If they are just, if they're gaining weight, if they're just, it's just very obvious that their cortisol is way too high, then we generally do carbs every single day for the first 90 days. And what I'll generally do is if they're been, because usually if, they, if they're in that situation, they've been carnivore for years, and the idea of even looking at rice makes them want to pee, like it's just terrifying. And so what we do is we start at like 20, 30 grams of carbs and we slowly increase over time, over the first 90 days. Usually symptoms decide at that point, they start to lose weight, they drop water weight, they feel better, they start sleeping better. As the carbs increase, we usually get to about 100, 120. Once that, once the first 90 days happens, we rerun blood labs. Once I know everything's okay, then we start implementing them around workouts. So I start really getting onto them about movement and building muscle because the biggest issue, honestly, cortisol is a big issue, especially for like long-term keto carnivore that have never flexed out. Um, but the biggest issue that women over 50 have is loss of muscle. That's a big issue. And they're scared to lift heavy and well, heavy relative to them. And so they don't actually build muscle in the gym. They just break a sweat and get their heart rate up. They don't actually like stimulate muscle growth and they don't eat enough protein. So we want to make sure they're doing that. And then to help keep the cortisol low, we just time the carbs around the workouts again so that we can use them as the most efficient way possible right because we want to do carbs with a purpose because they're not essential so if we're going to use them they need to have a purpose in our diets yeah. Evan. uh sunlight can you explain the difference between going outside and getting sun versus being in your car and having that sun come through the window yeah, absolutely. So our windows are tinted for one. It's like, it's like wearing sunglasses. So fun fact, I found this out actually a couple of weeks ago. It's funny you brought that up. Sunglasses are not good for you. They really knock off your circadian rhythm. They really, really do. I know we're all like, I just bought these shades. They made it look good, but like, they're not good for you. I still wear them. Don't worry. I still wear them on sunny days. Um, I'm just guilty as charged, but they're not technically good for you because they get in the way of your eyes actually absorbing the sun. And so it knocks everything off. The car window is no different, right? It's no different than like standing in front of a tinted window in your house and trying to get sun. You're like, I'm getting sun, but I'm staying cool. It's like, not technically, because that tint, there's a reason why it, it absorbs the rays that you benefit from, especially red lights, especially red lights. Tints really dim red light absorption. And so, yeah, if you're like in your car for two hours and you're like, I got my sun on the drive home. No, not technically, not technically. The red light therapy? No, so that's a that's a good question. So there are times, and this is controversial. There are times I think it's okay to supplement with vitamin D, right? Because I think there's people that genetically over time got much better at absorbing the little light they did get in northern climates but the thing is is that we live in a world now where everybody migrates a lot so people that have ancestry that's like in south america where they need a lot of sun move up to like north dakota and they're like depressed skeletons all the time right and so and so i think i think it it, it yeah it is okay to supplement with vitamin d i do think though that yeah oh okay sorry um, I do think that there are um, times though where you can get a little bit more challenging with yourself. Like 
for example, um, I'm in Kentucky, and last time I was there, I'm always big on like an hour of sunlight. And I would go, and I would go with my uh, my jacket and my shirt, and I would find a comfy place on the porch when the sun was at its highest. I would lay down and I would just roll up my shirt, not not all the way, just like right here, right above the navel. And then I would just I would just lay down and I would like listen to an audio book. And so the rest of me was staying warm. It was just a little bit of uncomfortable exposure, but I could feel the heat on my stomach. I knew the sun was hitting my skin and that's all that really mattered. So I think that oftentimes we have to be willing to be a little bit creative when we decide to live in those climates or we maybe we didn't decide, maybe we just live there um, and figure out how to navigate that. But I think supplementing with vitamin D is okay. I think you have to be careful because you don't want vitamin D toxicity and you want to be careful about the sourcing of the vitamin D. But I would say if you're in a really bad climate where you can't, you're going to get like, let's say 30 minutes a day and it's tolerable, I would, I can't say it depends on the person, but anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000 IUs, I wouldn't do like the, the people would be like 20,000 IUs, they don't need that much. So you're talking about the white therapy. So you're talking about like the white lights? Yeah. I think that, I don't know, is it, I don't feel like, I, 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 okay, I'll say this. I have not personally read the literature on red on red lights I have, but not the white lights. I do know that they produce luxes. I'm not sure exactly how deep that goes and how effective it is. A lot of those companies can pull things out of their, you know, hindquarters and be like, hey, this happened. And it's like, yeah, it happened to somebody in Austria that also gets sunlight. So, but yeah, so that, I mean, honestly, I don't have a perfect answer for that. Good? Okay, awesome.